Uh, Tim, can you speak to what's going on in the Catholic community? Can you talk about a language problem? Ah, yeah, all right. Hello? Oh, there we go. <clears throat> if you talk about a language problem, uh, like people in positions of authority not speaking to other people correctly, Catholic clergy and then young Catholics, uh, you're talking about multiple generation gaps because statistically they're going to be really old men and increasingly they're uh, not, not English as a first language men either because we're running out of American priests. So there's, for young Catholics who go to a church, there might not be something that they can even understand right away because the language comes from a previous church era, it comes from a previous social era, and there might not be a lot of connect between those two. So the movement now is to free the message of Catholicism from the church hierarchy, which historically has proven difficult and often led to uh, you know, all kinds of terrible things like inquisitions and schisms and things of that nature. So. It's uh, a tough thing to have to do, but young Catholics are trying to claim that message and take it not away from the church, but parallel to it so that younger people or in their own peer cohort can understand what they're saying because there's a lot for the church to offer young people, especially in terms of social action, common action for the common good and interfaith engagement, but without the right words being spoken to them, it can be tough. So. Uh, I've seen this most explicitly on college campuses, I think, where there might not be a clergy person there uh, to sort of lead the thing. So it's the students themselves who are doing it. So they have to educate about their own faith so they can talk to other Catholics about that. Um, outside the church, capital C, all kinds of Christian communities are doing the same thing. They're in this desperate race to be relevant, to stay relevant, and to increase their relevancy as time goes on so that people who grow up and who start families now have a place to go where they understand the language, they are given tasks to do, like be a good person, help your community, and where they can meet other people like them and know that they are not alone in a world that very often seems kind of isolating. The young generation is prepared to take over the ma mantle, essentially. Oh, yes, by any means necessary. <laughs> so, so here's another question. We know that it's not just overseas that young people are drawn to extreme versions, extremist versions of the world's religions. Uh, and here in the US, the internet is a big portal for that. A lot of lonely teenagers, you know, at night when mom and dad have gone to bed or on the laptop learning some pretty disturbing ideas. What role can healthy religious communities provide to draw those loners into the temple, the synagogue, the church, to, to bring them into the fold of a community with life-affirming values? I get asked this question a lot, actually, um, in my work with policymakers and on um, advisory boards on violent extremism. And I, I really think we have to broaden it even to, to understand that it's not just extreme religion, but it's really extreme ideology. And, and sometimes it's uh, white supremacy, sometimes it's um, you know, an extreme version of environmentalism. So it's, it's, a, it's young people are, are prey to people selling extreme ideology. And I think that young people are drawn, that those who, who end up in, in that, um, who fall into that trap, are essentially drawn to these ideologies for two main reasons. One, identity, looking for a place to belong, the same reasons people join gangs or anything else. But two, it's, there is some real anger out there. And that anger can be capitalized on in both positive and negative ways. If you think about any social movement or any social change, it, it, does, it is triggered by someone looking at something and saying, there is injustice here and it makes me really mad and I'm gonna do something about it. And so I think that if we, if we take those two things, it goes back to what Imam Suhaib Webb said about fellowship and so we have to create fellowship within our communities. There has to be a sense of belonging where people feel um, that 
that they are, be, they are safe in their communities to be their real selves. And second, we have to channel that healthy anger at injustice in constructive ways. Because in, in many cases, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention, right? And so we have to look at these young people, respect that anger, and give them a better way to uh, channel that energy into something that, that builds instead of destroys. Anybody else want to speak uh, to this question? Tim? I, I think that uh, Dahlia is spot on with that point. If you're talking about weapons to pick up, like pens, uh, keyboards, that kind of thing, tools where if you are angry about a particular issue and it pertains to your religion or your deep conviction somewhere, write a letter to your legislator, those kinds of things, or organize a march. There are numerous examples of people of faith uh, going extreme, but in ways that are beautiful and life-affirming and good. So taking that extra step um, to organize a day of action right in your community, those are things that ordinarily you wouldn't do unless you could be drawing on a deep well of faith and you had the weapons at your disposal like your other friends and the community organizing tools available to you to make change happen. So you're right about uh, channeling that those feelings into positive areas, and I think that uh, religious people have a lot of that energy to channel. That's a very real concern, I think, for all of us. I can certainly say as a journalist, I see a lot of press releases uh, across my inbox threshold. Religious communities are out there working on a lot of social justice issues. They're providing meals for the poor, they're rallying around uh, you know, questions of civil rights. Just this morning I was rereading letters from Birmingham jail, which is a call from Martin Luther King Jr., not just to Americans as a whole, but very specifically to his fellow religious brethren to support him in his quest for civil rights. And saying, you know, this is the moment to act in this way, lest that rage boil over and, and you know, take over the discussion that the nation is having at this moment. I guess the question is how religious communities can get the word out and include more young people in those activities because they're pretty cool. Simone, I take it you want to add something? I just wanted to add one thing on to the two wonderful comments that were made, um, that how important history is in learning about these issues. Um, like Meha and I are in this class and we're talking about how civil rights, um, the civil rights movement, exactly as you're saying, Rachel, that was, oh, sorry. That was brought on by religious people as have the uh, many historical um, social change movements been brought on by religious people. And wouldn't that be extremely empowering if we as young people could learn about that in our schools, that that history wouldn't get brushed under the table because it's not PC to talk about, but actually we could acknowledge the really powerful work that religious people have done throughout history to enact social change. I think that would be pretty major, and I'm pleased that ING and other organizations are working towards that education.